Two weeks ago, I started a, a message and it's leading into a series that we're going to do uh, for the first part of this year, the, uh, maybe about the first quarter of the year. Uh, but uh, I, I entitled it A New Year's Revolution. And so today it's just kind of a, uh, a New Year's Revolution is continued. And we're just going to, uh, in a way, pick up a little bit where I left off. And then we're going to lead into next week where uh, I'll begin to share with you uh, from Matthew chapter 5 and what we call the Beatitudes of the Lord. Uh, but just a real quickly in, in the notes, if you want to follow along in the, the bulletin, uh, uh, what we covered two weeks ago, we first of all highlighted Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verses 1 and 2, and uh, where Paul said, Be imitators of God, therefore as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And we, we talked about a revolution, what, what that word means, what a revolution is. And uh, uh, I, I highlighted that uh, a revolution overthrows an existing institution or philosophy. That's Webster's definition. Overflowing, over, overthrowing an existing institution or philosophy. Uh, and then what I highlight from God's Word is uh, a revolution as far as uh, in God's design, we could say, is one that overflows with love. And we used 1 Thessalonians 3.12 uh, to kind of define that, where it says, May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else. And I share that this is a verse that has really kind of been consuming me and uh, it, it just stays with me. I mean, every day at some point, I reflect on this verse uh, because I, I either encounter somebody or uh, one of you or, or someone else, uh, and I'm, I, you know, just the impression of the Lord to help me overflow with love, to increase in love for each other and for everyone else. And so we, we talked about making this year's revolution uh, using uh, uh, the letters L-A-L-O-L -L from Ephesians 5.12, live a life of love. Now, I'm going to ask, the last couple of weeks, anybody been kind of uh, dwelling on that? You know, since then, when we, you know, just talking about that L-A-L-O-L, -L -L, you know, live a life of love. We put it on the front sign there. Uh, hopefully it catches people's attention. And, you know, when they first, when they see the first, just those five letters, you know, kind of, you know, what, what does that mean? And the, they can put it together to live a life of love. But that, that, that's the revolution. That's what is going to over, overthrow this world and its philosophies. And it's, you know, when we overflow with the love of God. We talk about not just, you know, talk about to, to live a life, not just a moment. You know, I think we're real good at, we'll have moments, you know, kind of moments of glory. Moments of uh, where we just love on somebody. Uh, but the idea to, to live a life, not just a moment, and then to be loved, not just to be nice. Again, I think we, we have a monopoly on being nice, but to be loved, to be the love of God. And that's what, uh, that's what we're going to see as we uh, dwell into uh, the, the Beatitudes of Christ. Uh, it's about being loved, not just trying to live a life of love, but to be that life of of love as well. And so today I just want to take it a little bit further. Uh, I want to take it a little bit further uh, and, and uh, you know, again, this, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I've never been consumed uh, by a message or uh, a, a truth like I have been uh, really the last couple of months. You know, even before Christmas, if you remember, I, I, I shared that, uh, that message of uh, you know, how to have an extraordinary uh, Christmas, you know, about, uh, you know, doing something extra, doing something for someone else. And uh, it's about being that love. And, and again, this, this has been a challenge for me. I mean, personally, uh, I've been wrestling with this because every day, uh, I'll just, the, you know, the conviction of the Holy Spirit will be there to increase in love, to overflow in love. And that, that's a good thing that, uh, you know, we, we are, are challenged and, and, and 
and, and God, uh, uh, you know, they, they maybe just, you know, hey, we wrestle with him sometimes. We, we wrestle with what he's trying to, to do in our life. And again, it, it's our human nature to kind of push back at times. And, and, and when, when God's uh, uh, working in us and when he's trying to mold us, you know, there's times that we, uh, we, we, we just fight it. And this has been, uh, you know, again, whether it's, whether it's a situation or uh, an individual that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I'll, 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 I'll be thinking back and I'll say, Lord, I, I know I could have done better here. I, I could have, you know, uh, you know, just help me. And, and as, as Paul said the, to the Thessalonians, may the Lord make your love increase. Again, the, the Lord will enable us. We can't do it on our own. You know, but that's sometimes I think what we try to do. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna love better. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do better. But uh, Paul said, "May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else." So let's take this a little further as we kind of move into next week. We'll be moving into uh, the Beatitudes uh, and, and, and so forth. But Jesus' teachings in Matthew chapter five through chapter seven, we call it the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Jesus was sitting on a mountainside. Uh, it's not just one teaching. It's a series uh, of teachings, but uh, Matthew records them with the, uh, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And, and I'll tell you, if you just take, if you, if you, if you take a month and just uh, concentrate and focus and study Matthew 5 through 7, you will be challenged and the Holy Spirit uh, will bring an increase into your life uh, that, I mean, you'll, you'll just, you'll, uh, you'll live differently. And, and, and just in those three chapters, but we're going to be looking uh, at, at the, uh, the opening verses there that we call the Beatitudes. But Jesus is teaching some foundational truths here, foundational truths for living your life and serving the Lord. Many people say, well, how, how can I serve the Lord? Well, this is what we're going to try to, with the Beatitudes, Christ is teaching how we can live our life and how we can serve Him. And so what we see here is Jesus, uh, two things here I want you to understand. Jesus teaches being over doing. And that's where we kind of get things wrong right away. Jesus teaches being over doing. What do I mean by that? Again, so much, so much of what we do, it's like, oh, I gotta do better. Uh, I just gotta do this better. I, 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 gotta, I gotta do this more. And our focus is on doing, and so we, we miss it. We, we, we miss it right from the beginning. Because our focus is on, uh, on action, on activity. And, and, and see, that, that's, that's the product, but we're not, we're not, we're, we're, we're not concentrating on uh, the foundation, and the foundation is being, being a follower of Christ, uh, being Christ-like. And, and so Jesus teaches being overdoing. It's not what you do, but who you are. Uh, the Lord, we need to understand, the Lord is not half as much interested in what you and I do as he is concerned with who you and I are. Now, do you understand what I'm saying there? I'll say that again, because it's kind of a, a, one of those long statements that, you know, he's halfway through, you're like, wait, say that again? You know, uh, 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 but the Lord is not half as much interested in what you and I do. But that's, the, that's what we spend the majority uh, of the time trying, is doing better, doing something, you know, and, and, and we, we spend all of our time trying to focus on that. And God, he, he just wants to focus on, on us he, and, and who we are in Him. And so the Lord is not half as much interested in what you and I do as He is concerned with who you and I are. He, uh, we're, we're His vessel. Uh, we're His created being. And, and, and we're, we're told that we're His masterpiece. We're His masterpiece. And, 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 if, and if we focus on letting uh, God uh, you know, uh, help us to uh, uh, become his masterpiece, then the natural byproduct will be then what we do. But we get, we get things mixed up. And we think we've got to do, but by doing something, you know, we become better and, 
and God wants to, he, he wants to mold us uh, first and then. So that's what, you know, uh, before Jesus uh, sent off his disciples, before he, he, he sent off, you know, before the early church, you know, Jesus was with his disciples, helping them to be his disciples first before he let them loose on this world. And when he finally did, we told, we're told in the book of Acts that they turned this world upside down. But it was about that as they were in the upper room there, and they became, they became those vessels filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they were able to do things. And so, um, again, Jesus teaches being over doing. That's why we're going to be studying the be attitudes, not the do attitudes. All right, we'll play on words there. Be attitudes. Be attitudes. These be attitudes are they're they're eight. They're, there's eight verses there. Eight blessings. Eight. If, I, I want to call them eight essential qualities. And, and I think really, you know, we, we talk so much about the fruit of the Spirit, right? We all know the fruit of the Spirit, you know, from, uh, from Galatians there. And, uh, but we forget about the Beatitudes, the blessings. And it's, they're not, it's not just about uh, blessings. They are about what Christ wants us to become, who he wants us to become. And so they're, uh, they're just as essential, uh, the, our pursuit of, of these beatitudes are just as essential as our pursuit of the fruit of the Spirit. And as, as, uh, as Paul said in Ephesians 5, 1, be imitators of God. And that's what, that's what Christ is teaching, is how we can be imitators of God, be his followers. So again, Jesus teaches being what we're doing. So I want you to get that. And then Jesus teaches edifying over examining. Jesus teaches edifying over examining. Now let me spend some time on this. What is that? Okay, being over doing, edifying over examining. Well, again, this is where we're gonna uh, we're gonna delve into our human nature here. We're gonna delve into uh, what what we're all like. All right. And, and the idea, first of all, is Jesus, uh, he teaches us to examine ourselves. Examine yourself. Examine yourself. And see, we're not, uh, we're, we're not real good at that. We're, 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 what we're good at is examining others. That comes easy. Yeah. You know, but it's about examining yourself and, 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 and edifying others. To examine yourself and edify others. Let me share some scriptures here. First of all, Matthew chapter 7, uh, verses 1 through 5. Now, this is part of that Sermon on the Mount, all right? This is chapter 7 of Matthew, and this is just a, a one section of it. But, but Jesus offers an illustration here to help us kind of understand our human nature, but uh, how he wants us to uh, follow him. In Matthew chapter 7, beginning verse 1, it says this, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And here you go, ask this rhetorical question here. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay, a no, pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now I want you to notice the comparison here that Jesus makes, all right? It's an illustration that he's saying here, but the comparison of a speck versus a plank. All right, you, you, you understand uh, the illustration there uh, that we can so easily see the little thing wrong with others, but we're missing the fact that there's uh, there, there's something more that that is in our life that we need to be concentrating on, that we need to focus on. And, and again, human nature—it's so easy uh, to, to to see uh, what's wrong with others. We're you know uh, we 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 our tendency is always to always to try to find something wrong. It, it, it's so easy uh, to, to find uh, what's wrong, and, and even if it's to, uh, to nitpick in it, and, and it's really, it, it is, it, it, is, is, that, is that important? But again, it, 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 
you know, it's easy. We can right away see what's wrong with others and we're not seeing our own lives. We're not seeing our own lives. Our vision, our perception uh, will always have a, a flaw, will always have a, 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 you know, a blurred vision. I mean, uh, that, 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 that it's human nature, but it's also physical. It's also physical. Some of you have noticed I'm not wearing glasses the last couple of weeks, or last week. All right? I, I, I've been thinking for some time and, and pursuing and trying to, uh, you know, see uh, about, about the, uh, having that, that LASIK uh, procedure done, that, that LASIK procedure done uh, about a week and a half ago. Uh, I did, all right? And it, it's, a, 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 it's really only about a 15-minute procedure, all right? It's, it's kind of intense, you know, uh, but uh, uh, the thing is, what I found out, I learned uh, the consultation uh, with the doctor, uh, you know, and, and the options that were given to me, and, and, and what took place is that, uh, you know, I learned that we have a dominant eye, you know, everybody has a dominant eye, my left eye is my dominant eye, and, and, I, and I learned that, you know, I thought I was going to have to have uh, maybe both eyes done, and uh, the option was given to me that, uh, you know, just do one eye, your dominant eye, and, and uh, see how uh, my brain works, you know, I don't know how my, my brain is still kind of uh, un, un, under uh, uh, examination to see if uh, things will work out. But, but they, they did the procedure to my left eye. And so now uh, my left eye is just like when I had my glasses on. My left eye, I can see at a distance, I can see everything clearly. And they said, let's leave your right eye alone. And so my right eye, I could see everything clearly up close. And they said, now, if your brain works right, or, <laughs> or, or whatever, you know, that, that your eyes will adjust. I'm still in that adjustment period. I had a follow-up this past week. We'll have a follow-up uh, next month, uh, and, and we'll, we'll see how things are, are, are going there. But uh, I can see at a distance. I can see people clearly. And then I can look down here, and I can see. I don't have to look under my glasses anymore uh, to read my notes or to read uh, the, the Bible passages. Right? And, and so, uh, so, you know, I'm feeling pretty good. I don't have to wear glasses, you know, and I'm, I'm still, you know, adjusting and it's still, he still healing. And, and, and my brain has to uh, still uh, adjust to the, the working both eyes so that they cooperate and everything is good. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing that I found out. That even if I had both eyes done, or if I didn't have any, if I chose not to have uh, either one of them or both of them, both of them done, uh, that, that the doctor said, uh, you're, there, there's going to be some area that's always going to be blurred. All right, if I had both eyes done, I would have to wear reading glasses, all right, and, and, and to, to, to read things up close. And so, the, again, the experiment kind of is to, uh, you, know, you know, just do the one and see what happens. Uh, but what I'm finding already is that, again, up close I can see clearly, out there I can see clearly, but I'm finding that that, that four foot to eight foot uh, uh, range is not so clearly, all right? I literally found out as I went to the store that uh, 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 to read what's on the shelves, I have to get right up to the shelf, all right? I can't, I can't back up, you know, in the aisle and still see everything, you know? And so, but but the, again, the, the, the doctor said that, you know, you're not gonna have perfect vision. You know, nobody has, perfect vision. There's a range, there's somewhere uh, along the line uh, that, that our, you know, everybody has a, a, a blurred vision, right? A, a plank in their eye. And so again, we need to understand that we see things, uh, you know, we, we, we see things, we examine things, and, and again, we don't, we don't examine them clearly. And so we, we need to understand that uh, Jesus is teaching here that examine yourself. Examine yourself. Don't, don't, don't examine others. Don't judge others. You know, uh, examine yourself. And, 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 and allow God uh, to, to mold you and to, uh, to work in you what needs to be taking place. And, and you, need to, you need to focus on that. You need to focus on that. And then what we need to do, Jesus taught, is to edify others. Edify others. Others. Look at Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. It kind of goes a little bit along here, uh, what we've been reading there in Matthew. But 
Paul says to the Galatians, Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Each one should test his own actions, then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else. And again, in, in these verses, uh, uh, it's, it's echoing that idea of testing yourself, uh, examining yourself, watch yourself. You know, and, and uh, you know, when you see somebody else, you know, immediately when you have that thought, oh, you know, they should do this, and, you know, turn it back to you, examine yourself. Again, the, 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 with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can begin to train ourselves to, uh, to do this. To, uh, this, is what, this is what Christ wants us to do. He wants us to examine ourselves and edify others. Examine ourselves, restore others, carry their burdens. All right? Don't, don't, you know, help them. Help them, not, uh, not criticize them, uh, not, not uh, uh, speak uh, badly about them, not find out, you know, and pursue uh, and tell everybody else what's wrong with someone else, but to examine yourself and carry, carry their burden. If anything, just carry their burden and, and to support each other. And, and so as, as we look, as, as, we, as we go into this, this, this year, this new year, as we, as we think about this revolution, you know, uh, to overthrow the way we've done things in the past, to, to overthrow our human nature, to overthrow uh, the, the enemy and his influence in our lives, and to rather overflow in love, to increase in love for each other, to overflow in love for everybody else. Again, it's a challenge. It, again, you'll, 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 you'll find each day that, that you're, uh, you're living differently. You're living a life of love. You're, you're looking at people differently because you're examining yourself and you're desiring to live a life of love, to be loved to others. So, again, why this L-A-L-O-L? -L? Why live a life of love? How many, what, what's the love chapter in the Bible? Right. First Corinthians 13. It's the one we call the love chapter. I think that's a I think that's a junior Bible quiz question. You know, uh, the love chapter. First Corinthians chapter one. Can I say this? Do we understand First Corinthians chapter 13 is not about marriage, right? But when do you hear First Corinthians 13? At weddings. That, that, I mean, seriously. When was the last time when we, and we understand 1 Corinthians 13 is not about marriage. But I think we've, we've reduced that passage of Scripture to be, oh, that's for a husband and wife. No. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul talked about marriage. But 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is in the middle uh, of, of, the, of, of Paul's letter to the Corinthians that is talking about the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it's talking about the body being of many parts and, and working together and, and exalting the head, which is Jesus Christ. And so chapter 13 is about living a life of love towards each other and towards everyone else, not just husband and wife, not just husband. And so when we, when we look at that passage, then I encourage you to spend some, some time there on your own. Uh, uh, this week and, and, and get back to uh, the, the intent and the purpose of that passage of scripture that is for how we are to live each and every day it's not isolated to a certain relationship but in general how we're to live uh, toward others and how, 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 how we're to uh, 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 bless others and when we look at this uh, when we look at this hallmark passage in scripture, it is crystal clear and it's razor sharp of what it means to love. And the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, just what love will do. 
and the absence of love, what it means when there is no love. And that's what, when we look at this, why live a life of love? Because no love equals no thing, nothing. The first three verses of 1 Corinthians 13, what does it say? I mean, it's crystal clear and it's razor sharp. What does it say? If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. What does that mean? If we don't have love, we're just making a bunch of noise. And anything you say, anything you do, means absolutely nothing. If you do not have love. And then verse 2, it says, If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Like, I, I understand what it's saying. That you can have you can have faith that that is miraculous faith. You know you can have all the uh, the, the charisma of uh, of, of uh, the greatest uh, uh, evangelists and uh, uh, faith healers and everything in, in, in history, but if you have love, it's nothing. You're nothing, and it means nothing. And then verse three: If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames. But have not love, I gained nothing. And then all, 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 all this, these first three verses, what it's saying is, it's talking about all that you could do, but if you are not love, all you do means nothing. All you do means nothing. You could be generous, you, you, uh, you, you could have uh, the greatest intentions, you could, uh, you know, you could speak uh, with uh, all wisdom and all, all, all knowledge, uh, but if you don't have love, if you're not, if you're not love, the love of God, to others, it, it, it's nothing. Absolutely nothing. And so when you understand that, why do we like a love? Because a life without love is nothing. It's nothing. And secondly, what verse 8 says, three words, crystal clear. Three words, love never fails. That's a statement. Love never fails. So many times we feel like life is a failure, we feel like we fail here, we fail here, we fail there. Well, maybe it's an indication that we're missing the foundation of love. Love, the promise is love never fails. Love never fails. You know, everything else, uh, uh, there are prophecies, tongues, knowledge, all of that is nothing. It passes away. But love never fails. Love never fails. Just if, we, if we just remember that each and every day and know how, how can this day be successful? Love. Love. Love never fails. And then lastly, why live a life of love? Because love is the greatest. Love is the greatest. The last verse of chapter 12. And again, understand, you know, when we talk about chapters and verses, you know, that God didn't do that, right? Man, man put numbers to chapters and verses to numbers to verses, you know. This is all, we need to look at this all one, one passage here of God speaking his word. And the last verse of chapter 12, uh, 1231 says, eagerly desire the greater gifts. And then Paul says, and now I will show you the most excellent way. The most excellent, the greatest way. And he starts talking about love. And then chapter 13, in the last verse of chapter 13, verse 13, it says, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. What does that say there? Again, you can have faith, you can have hope, but if you don't have love, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. Love is the greatest. Love is what we need to uh, desire. Love, love, love is what we need to pursue. This is what Jesus was teaching, being love. Being love. Examine yourself. And then in the middle of that chapter, uh, that, that chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, that uh, those verses, verses 4 through 7, that practically every wedding ceremony I've done, the, people, the couple once, that passage. 
which is good. I'm not, please, please don't think I'm saying, okay, get rid of chapter 13 for weddings, all right? I, no, but just understand, don't limit it to uh, just something that a husband and wife should be doing. All right, but in, the, in those verses, four through seven, that gives you a little bit of a love checklist or what I call a love test list. You know, love is patient, love is kind. It's not envious, it's not boastful, it's not prideful, it's not rude, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love doesn't delight in evil, but it rejoices in the truth. I like this, that, that verse, uh, verse 7, it always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. And there's just, again, how to examine yourself. How to examine yourself, and I, I tell you, man, I, 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 go, I go through that list uh, uh, that's part of what, uh, what I've been wrestling with personally in my life is I can go through that list and why oh, I wasn't patient today. Or I, 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 I was kind of keeping a record of wrongs there. I was finding out, I was just looking at what was wrong with somebody. I was just, you know, again, and I, again, I don't, we, we, we will. Most of the time, fall short there. But again, examine yourself. Examine yourself and, and, and let God's Holy Spirit, uh, you know, help you, strengthen you, and, and help you to become love. The Holy Spirit helped me to become love.